Okay, looks like it's 10 a.m. So we'll go ahead and get started. Um, welcome everyone and good morning. Uh, my name is Meredith Mavero and I'm the manager of student programs and community outreach for the Institute of Politics. Um, and again, welcome to our panel discussion on addressing education equity during and after the pandemic. We are so pleased that you found time to join us this morning for this important conversation about how education has been reimagined, how policy will shape the future of equity in education and how you can help. Uh, today, you'll learn more about how you can get involved in education equity and other policy issues with the LC Forum. Uh, then you'll learn more about the IOP and its education policy committee where we'll hear from a few of its members, including State Representative Ed Feeney, Dean Valerie Kinlock of Pitt School of Education, and Dr. Stan Thompson, the Senior Program Director for Education and the Executive Director of Pittsburgh Readiness Institute at the Heinz Endowments. All of our panelists are working very hard to improve education equity in our, in our region and are major contributors to the IOP's Education Policy Committee's latest project, Learning from Crisis, Creating Nimble, High-Performing Learning Environments that Provide Continuity and Equity in Education. Following the panel discussion, there will be an opportunity for the audience to ask questions. Uh, using the Q&A function of the Zoom webinar. So if you have a question, feel free to type it in there at any point during the discussion. And our moderator will pose your questions to our panelists during the question and answer portion of this program. But before we dive into the edu education equity discussion, allow me to introduce the LC Hillman Civic Forum. Uh, and highlight a few ways students and community members can get involved with us. The LC Forum provides Pitt students and community partners the opportunity to join together and work on education equity or other social issues. Uh, students can get hands-on experience working with an elected official, a nonprofit, or other agency through one of our long-term experiential programs, or discuss these issues with community leaders at the Never a Spectator Civic Engagement Forum. Uh, they could talk with an elected official at Legislator for a day, or learn more about governance and policy through the Dick Thornburg Forum Lectures and the IOP's new Governing in Crisis video series, which you'll actually see a brief clip of later. The LC Forum leverages the existing relationships of the IOP and its committees and provides opportunities for students to get involved in one or more of the four civic pathways that the IOP itself engages in. For example, students can intern with an elected official. Uh, they can learn and learn how policy shaped. They could join the LC Scholars Program or Ambassadors for Civic Engagement Fellowship and see how their uh, organizations influence policy through activism or community organizing or how philanthropy influences policy priorities, all while engaging uh, with communities and its leaders to help address major policy issues our region is facing. Uh, students can even join in the work of the IOP and its Education Policy Committee or any of the other policies uh, by being an intern with the Institute itself. Um, in fact, we have a student working with us on this project that you'll be learning more about today. But to shed more light on the Institute of Politics and the work of its various, various policy committees, we'll hear from Samantha Baudier, the director of the Institute and the LC Forum. Um, prior to joining the IOP, she worked on a range of policy issues uh, facing the nonprofit sector as the executive director of the Forbes Fund's Greater Pittsburgh Nonprofit Partnership, which is a coalition of over 450 organizations from Southwestern Pennsylvania. So with that, I hand it over to, to Sam. Thanks, Meredith. Good morning, everyone. Um, we're very pleased that you're here today to hear more about one of the projects the Institute of Politics is working on, but that our region and our country um, are very concerned about, and that's education equity and how we've realized through the pandemic um, the importance of addressing equity in education. Not that we didn't know that that was a significant issue prior to the pandemic, but um, 
the way in which students have had to go to school over the last several months has really highlighted the inequities through the system. The reason the Institute of Politics is addressing this issue is um, really core to who we are. The Institute of Politics was created about 30 years ago within the chancellor's office at the university to address important regional issues across southwestern Pennsylvania. We do this in three major ways. The first is our core regional policy work um, where we conduct uh, business and analysis for over 600 stakeholders across the region on a regular basis, addressing the topics that you hear that you see today on this slide. Um, we also uh, implement the Dick Thornburg Forum for uh, Law and Public Policy, which um, offers a series of lecture, um, a, a series of lecture series, and also um, uh, that we're implementing a video series now and a podcast series in light of the pandemic and not being able to convene everybody in person. Um, so you're going to hear about uh, the governing series that's available for you that uh, has folks who are speaking from the federal, federal and state perspective on major governance issues that have arisen out of this crisis. Um, I believe we're going, you're going to hear from Bob Shearer, director of the Allegheny Intermediate Unit, this morning in an interview that he conducted with Chancellor Emeritus Nordenberg uh, about a month ago. We also offer, as you heard from Meredith, the Elsie Hillman Civic Forum, which is an array of student-based programming and ways that students at the university and faculty can involve themselves on these key issues. What's in front of you right now are uh, the names of our public policy committees. Um, we do a range of work here that, um, that starts with you know, providing the community and leaders uh, policy briefs and short-term research, um, applied research within these topic areas. At the, at the center of everything we do is civic engagement because we do this research through partnerships that are established through our policy committees. Um, we do everything from policy briefs, policy research, and even systems reform that um, we're working on right now and have been for a long time through our criminal justice reform efforts. The person I wanna introduce now is um, Brianna Mihawk. Brianna Mihawk is our senior policy strategist at the IOP. She's been with us for over 11 years and she helps manage these um, policy committees that we have here. You're gonna be hearing from our education committee today and um, three of the leaders who are on our committee. We work with philanthropy, um, leadership within the university and elected officials. Brianna uh, is well suited and is a big asset to the Institute of Politics. She is the uh, former research analyst for Senator John Pippi and she's earned both her bachelor's and master's degree from the University of Pittsburgh and is currently pursuing her doctorate in education um, on social and comparative analysis in education. So with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Brianna, but I encourage anyone who's interested in learning more about the Institute of Politics to visit our website and um, to look for us on social media and you'll be able to keep up to date on um, the array of really important issues that we're addressing um, every day through the Institute. So, Brianna. Thank you, Samantha. And today, uh, as Samantha indicated, our distinguished panel will be discussing education equity more broadly. Um, they will identify specific inequities present in our current system and in our region. Uh, we'll examine some ways to move forward uh, through public policy development and offer suggestions for the community to get involved and why it's so important to get involved in this issue. And now to introduce our panelists, I will start with Representative Ed Ganey. State Representative Ed Ganey represents the 24th Legislative District, which encompasses a number of Eastern neighborhoods within the city of Pittsburgh, including East Liberty, Bakery Square, and Homewood, and also part of the borough of Wilkinsburg. He graduated from Morgan State University with a bachelor's degree in business management and worked for the city of Pittsburgh as a community development specialist until his election to the House of Representatives in 2012. 
As a legislator, his priorities include labor issues, education, transportation, and community development. And he serves as the Democratic Vice Chair of the Appropriations Committee and the Democratic Policy Committee. And he's also a member of the Institute's Education Policy Committee. Welcome, Representative Ganey. Um, next, I'd like to introduce Dean Valerie Kinlock. She's the Renee and Richard Goldman Dean of the University of Pittsburgh School of Education, a position that she's held since July of 2017. Prior to that, she spent nine years at the College of Education and Human Ecology at Ohio State University, where she served as a professor of literacy and the associate dean of diversity, inclusion, and community. She received her PhD uh, in English and Composition Studies from Wayne State University, and she's authored numerous books on race, education, and equity. And since arriving at Pitt, she's strengthened the School of Education's commitment to advancing equity and justice in society through education. And she's also a member of the Education Policy Committee here at the Institute. Welcome, Dean Kinlock. And I'd also like to introduce our third panelist, Dr. Stan Thompson. He's the Senior Director of the Heinz Endowments Education Program and the Executive Director of the Pittsburgh Readiness Institute, which works with others in the community to ensure that K through 12 students in our region are community and future ready. Uh, before joining the endowments in September of 2008, he was the Executive Director of Times Squared Academy for Engineering, Mathematics, Science and Technology, which is a charter school in Providence, Rhode Island that provides a learning environment that exposes children, particularly students of color, to technology, engineering, mathematics, and science. Throughout his career, he has also served as a middle and high school English teacher, a professor, and the director of a center for career and technical education. And he currently serves as the chair of the Institute's Education Policy Committee. Welcome, Dr. Thompson, and thank you all for being here. Um, as Samantha noted earlier, I would like to begin our panel discussion today with a clip from our governing series, uh, governing in crisis series. And recently we were fortunate enough to have Dr. Shearer, the new director of the Allegheny Intermediate Unit as a guest on that series. And uh, we have a clip here from that interview where he'll describe some of the inequities uh, that he sees in districts across Allegheny County. funding and equity concerns uh, across the nation, but certainly here in Pennsylvania, um, do make things difficult. Um, the funding formula really does benefit those school districts uh, with, you know, with, with higher property values, um, with uh, sources of income that are greater than those, those districts that, that, that aren't in that, in that situation. And so those equity challenges have always been in place. Now you add a layer of, well, how do we support remote learning, for, for instance? Um, you have school districts that prior to COVID had very robust technology programs and they were utilizing equipment, they were utilizing uh, technological resources, you had families that had access to Wi-Fi at home. Those are the school districts that were able to pivot rather quickly and, and continue that learning trajectory where for other school districts, it was almost as if they were starting from scratch. And so that has certainly exacerbated some of the inequities that existed prior to COVID-19. Thank you. So I'll start with our first question. Uh, the Aspen Institute's Education and Society Program defines educational equity as every student has the right to, has access to the right resources that they need at the right moment in their education, regardless of race, gender, sexual orientation, ethnicity, language, nationality or immigration status, disability, family background or family income. They continue, equity does not mean creating equal conditions for all students, but rather targeting resources based on individual student needs and circumstances. In existing state policy, our Pennsylvania Constitution states that the General Assembly shall provide for the maintenance and support of a thorough and efficient system of public education to serve the needs of the Commonwealth but it does not specifically address equity. Similarly, our PA school codes only reference to equity is part of a funding formula that is no longer in use. So could you tell us a little bit about 
what equity in education looks like to you and how does it relate to the purpose of education as a whole? And Dean Kinlock, I'd like to start with you. Sure, thank you for having me, Brianna. Um, so your question about equity and what it looks like or what it entails, I think simply stated, I would say that equity is an approach um, to teaching and learning. It's an approach that ensures that students have full access to humanizing educational experiences and to high quality educational resources. It means that students have opportunities to really learn and to have access to learning opportunities that will help them to not just survive, but also to thrive in society, in any type of career, job, or educational experience that they seek to actually take on. Um, when we think about equity, I think I start with this basic understanding that equity is an intentional effort to acknowledge and address and then to dismantle both historical and present day inequalities um, and pervasive injustices that impact people and how people live based on their living conditions and situations, but also how people are able to interact within learning environments with teachers, with peers, in ways where we are able to talk about the resources that they truly do need in order to be successful and in order to engage in achievement. Um, I think it's all about opportunity. It's all about the ways in which we understand that students and particularly Black, Latinx, Indigenous, and other students of color must be afforded opportunities for success. And then I think finally, I would say that, you know, for me, educational equity is at the heart of what we do. So if it's the center of teaching and learning and engagement, when we think of ed educational equity, we have to think about not just technological resources, but that's a part of it. So we think about access to technology and the resources for teaching and learning in a remote virtual context. But we also have to think about organizations in communities we have to think about families and access to resources that they also need in order to survive and thrive. We have to think about educational leadership. You know, who are the people who are in positions to affect change in a systematic level? Um, and we have to also think about access to food, transportation, and all of these material, financial, and technological resources that might appear to be barriers to people's learning and opportunity. And so when I think about equity, all of those things have to come into play and we have to take a more collaborative approach to ensuring that all kids have, an ac have access to high quality learning and engagement opportunities within schools, but also within communities and within society writ large. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Thompson, Representative Ganey. Stan, you're on mute. So for me to add to what uh, Dean Kenlock so um, adeptly stated, um, I would say that at the core of equity is the understanding of who your kids are and how to meet their needs. Um, it doesn't mean that you don't continue to have outcomes or uh, a focus on results for them, but it means that the path, to, the, the path to get them there may not be the same for each one. Um, for me, I see it as, um, as an opportunity where you can create a diverse environment where individual strengths create a complementary and collaborative venue, uh, where personalized support is provided so that individuals can realize their potential. Um, when I think about the purpose of education, I'm struck by something that Socrates said years ago, that the unexamined life is not worth living. And I think in K through 12 education, um, one of the things that we should be focused on is preparing students for life. And what that means is for continuous learning, for work, for living within a family, however you want to define that, and within a community, um, and for participating effectively in the democratic process. 
Um, I think for me also, um, one of those things that um, I've been delving into in philanthropy and in, uh, specifically around this thing called the Readiness Institute or five critical questions. Uh, I think it's important that students know who they are, who they want to become, how to get there, how to continue to grow and learn, and then finally, the importance of how to give back to their community. I think this is part of what Socrates was talking about. And within that context, within the kind of support that we can provide, I think we can indeed be focused on equity in education. So um, that's what I would contribute to what I think Dean Kenlock had astutely framed for this discussion. I, I think Dean Kenlock really, you know, she said it all, you know, um, equity is about access. And our ability to have access is the way that we change and develop our minds. Um, you take a lot of these kids, if they see the same thing every single day, particularly coming out of low-income communities, what I try to explain to them is that learning breaks poverty. And the reason why education becomes so important and why access is so important is because the more that we can show these children, the more they can dream to be what they want to be. Sometimes if they don't see, if they don't have access to be able to see certain things, they get stuck in the mindset that what they see every day becomes the reality. And even though you live that reality, that is not your future reality. Your future reality is what you dream to be. But I can't, I can't impregnate that thought unless I show you access to different things that you can be. Not just an NFL player, not just an NBA player, not just someone that does here, but you can be what you want to be. So I think number one is access. And when you talk about access, you got to talk about it from a couple of different levels. One is funding. You know, you, you said it perfectly. The funding formula really benefits um, communities that have a higher tax base. But the reality is we can't continue to have that level of funding go to them if we're going to talk about how we break poverty. You need to have some of your best teachers in your, some of your low-income in in some of your low-income community schools to help them children see. And the second thing is diversity in teachers. You need to see more black and brown teachers in this school system, that they understand the social economics that these kids come from, that they understand the racial disparities that they deal with that they can understand and also help them help them un help them know their history. We got to change the way we see history. It just can't be from a European lens that this is what history is. I often tell people, particularly my colleagues, we study more European history than we study American history. You know, we study, you know, they don't understand how blacks, whites, Latinos, Asians, Jews, we all help build this great country. We all contribute, but you don't always see that in the text of the American textbook as we see it today. It's more of a, with a European lens. We got to make it a more of an American lens so each one of our racial groups can understand their contributions to this great country called the United States. So when you talk about equity, equity is, again, redefining the history so that everybody can understand who Frederick Douglass was and how he got here, how we overcame slavery, what it meant to be three-fifths of a man, what it meant to go through Jim Crow, what it meant not to be able to loan, own land, put money in a bank, go to school, what it meant to say, listen, Hey, George Washington was the first president, but if African Americans men couldn't vote for the fifth to the fifteenth amendment, and women couldn't vote to the nineteenth amendment, then yeah, he's America's first for president, but he's not mine because we couldn't vote. So you know, people need to know that. Know how we moved into civil rights, whites here, um, colors only, even into talking about how we deal with mass incarceration and what's that done and the impact that it's had in community. We have a host to be able to talk about how learning breaks poverty. But until we have access to true history and really breaking down how far we've come as a people, as a race, that's always going to be a problem and a barrier that we have to overcome. So the more access we give our kids, the more they can dream, the more they can think, the more they can escape the poverty in which they come from. Thank you. That's that's great. Um, really powerful. And. I actually would like to direct the next question to you, Representative Ganey, uh, first. So we've seen the inequities in our education system. You talked about them, Dr. Shearer talked about them. Um, and nothing in this COVID-19 crisis is equitable from who contracts the disease to who's suffering from unemployment to what communities are affected and who's affected when schools aren't physically able to open. 
So earlier this year, the Commonwealth released $5 million in equity grants to schools for technology purchases to kind of help um, ameliorate some of those needs that were exacerbated by the COVID crisis. Um, but we know that there's much more work that needs to be done. And so in your district, in your work as a state legislator, what have you seen um, in your communities? What do, what do you take away from this and what should policymakers take away from this crisis? Again, I think it's just, a, you know, um, some of the same challenges that was there before COVID-19 is there now. Um, I think has it created a, a, a has it created different barriers? Absolutely, yeah, it has. Let's be honest, it has. But I think some of the biggest barriers that I receive in terms of phone calls on the call is that, you know, we're we're entering into really a new era. This whole virtual learning to many people is new. So you take a mom that's working two jobs or three jobs just to make ends meet, and now she has to be able to cut back on one job. She's trying to understand this thing called Zoom or Microsoft Teams or whatever other. Um, virtual reality mechanism we're using to communicate education to our kids, she has to learn that. Now, she may not have the best education, so it's difficult. She might have a problem with internet access, so she, now she can't even get online. You, you got to deal with that. And what if the internet is not working? What if it's out for a couple hours? So what I have seen is that certain after-school programs have created what we call hubs here, that they can send their kids there to be able to still get educated, to still have the, to be able to meet the technology demand. And we also have to talk to our corporate partners because as more after school programs are going to do this, they're going to need help. We know, I was a kid, I'm, you know, let me say me, all right, I'm going to say, hey, you know, if I would have had to carry a laptop around, it would have been broke by week two. Now I'm just being honest, it would have been broke by, I'd either left it somewhere, you know, <laughs> it would have been a problem. And so what I'm saying is that this is where we have to pull together. We know that these after-school programs are going to do their part, particularly in low-income communities. There needs to be infrastructure set up to where we're helping them, to we're making sure they got the right technology, to we're making sure if one laptop breaks down that there's another one right on site that they can use to help these kids. But I also think it's a great opportunity. I do. I think it's a great opportunity. Like I tell these kids right now, I think that there's a difference for me, and this is what I tell them. There, you know, when you focus on education, you focus on the school building. And sometimes when you focus on the school building, you really don't get the understanding that education breaks poverty. But when I talk about learning and what they learn every single day, what they choose to learn every single day, going to school, not just because you want to get an education, but going to school because you want to learn. If you learn, you're going to get an education. So you don't see the school building as just something that you have to do to get an education, but you see the school building or now the virtual reality of how you learn in order to break the, break the chains of poverty and give you an opportunity to do more in life. And that's why I said the number one thing about equity is access. If you give these kids access to a greater vision of what they can be, you give them something to strive for. They feel good about themselves because they're learning. But if you make it like, oh, well, this is just education. You got to do this. No, got to do this means that you have to learn how to break the chains of poverty. And so we need to work with our after school program. There needs to be a higher connect between Pittsburgh Public Schools, PPS, the universities in the area, the workforce development that's out here right now. Where are we going? How are we getting there? How is the education being drawn down to the PPS level in any other school district? So we're preparing them for the new market because if we would have been able to prepare them for the new market when it came to virtual learning, the moms that are dealing with it in a difficult manner would have been more prepared than they are today. Thank you. Um, Dr. Thompson, Dean Kimlock. So I think I've heard the, uh, the phrase access and opportunity um, used several times, Representative Ganey, uh, Dr. Shearer used it in his video. And there's no doubt in my mind that uh, these two things are key to student success in education, especially when you look at how things have been exacerbated by the, um, the, corona uh, the coronavirus, COVID-19. Um, philanthropy has supported school communities who have lacked 
the basic digital wherewithal um, during this time to make the transition to, to remote learning. I have to say this though, providing for basics was the moral, was the essential response that I think we could do. However, when you look at urban districts, rural districts um, who had received the, um, the devices, who had also received connectivity, uh, and many of them, by the way, are still struggling with the notion of connectivity, consistent connectivity. The, what, what had happened is you saw districts who had spent most of last year remediating during remote learning. And so one of the things that, um, that I'm concerned about, and, and I think that Dr. Shearer had, had pointed this out, is that the, the more affluent um, districts um, were continuing their learning uninterrupted because of having digital fluency, because of the one-to-one -one student to um, uh, device ratios that they had. And having had that opportunity, they could go on to deeper learning experiences. Um, that, that wasn't the case for districts like PPS. It wasn't the case for rural districts. And so I think we have an opportunity to begin to think about what is next? How do we move from a reaction to uh, COVID-19 and remote learning to how do we move towards recovery? And I think some of the things that uh, Representative Ganey has highlighted um, are things that I've thought about and things that we need to continue to think about. I think that philanthropy is looking at ways in which we might be able to uh, continue to provide support as districts pivot into this new world because this is not going away. At the same time, I think that there are things that we're going to be required to do to make sure that teachers are supported, that parents are supported, that communities writ large are given the opportunities um, to not only figure out how they can be a resource to this new, um, new environment of learning, but, uh, but more importantly, to make sure that we are providing the kind of support that is personalized for their particular needs. Because a one size does not fit all, especially when you have families, when you have students, who have, not have, who have not had access to the kinds of learning uh, opportunities that, uh, that many of uh, the districts that uh, uh, Dr. Scherer and, and Representative Ganey have, uh, have alluded to. So, so I think you know, this, this notion of recovery, this notion of transformation is something that we want to move towards because of this disruption and see it as an opportunity, but there are other things that we're gonna to have to do in order to get folks to that place. And, um, and you know, it's not gonna happen overnight, but it is something that I believe can happen. And this is where equity is going to be very important, where we're going to be able to see equity in motion, not simply as rhetoric, but something that is really taking on a life of its own and transforming the lives of individuals who have not had that access, who have experienced all sorts of disparities. Um, these are the things that I think we have an opportunity to address and to address those things with some real fidelity. I think we know what we need to do. I think we have the resources. The question is, do we have the will to do it? And can we sustain that? Yeah, I agree. I agree with both, um, you know, both of the comments here. I think that I know that we know what to do. Um, and we've known what to do for a very long time. We know what kids need because families tell us what kids need. We know what kids need because kids tell us what they need. 
when we walk into classrooms and when we teach other people's kids as if they're our own kids, and that's the approach I hope we take, we know what kids need because they tell us and they show us every day we are with them. And so we don't need to start from a place where we are questioning what is it that we should do differently. We need to start from a place of what are we going to do differently beginning right now in this very moment. And we can't wait for a pandemic, which we are currently in. We knew what to do before. The reality is, are we bold enough and aggressive enough to change the educational landscape in this country in order to ensure that all of our kids are getting everything that they are entitled to? You know, when we talk about learning, for example, I think sometimes we talk about education and we conflate education with learning. And Ed Ganey just did a perfect analysis of distinguishing between education as something that happens in a school and learning is something that happens everywhere. And you know, education happens everywhere. But in this country, we have tended to lean toward this idea that education happens within a school building only. And the reality is education happens everywhere people gather and everywhere people are. And if we think about learning as an opportunity for us to really get this right for kids and with kids, for parents and with families, with communities and within school districts, then we start asking ourselves different questions. And one of the questions that we have to ask ourselves is how are we not doing what we know we need to do? How are we not reallocating resources to the communities and the schools and the districts and the families who really need us the most? How are we not understanding that scripted curriculum from all of our kids just doesn't kid it? It doesn't cut what we need to cut through. How is it that we are not talking about equity as the most transformative effort that we can actually engage in in this country and hence in the world that will not just level the playing field, but that would actually repair harm and damage that has been done to countless communities and families who feel as if they can't walk into a school building and be seen as full human beings. Like these are the questions that we need to cut to the heart at and to really ask ourselves, what are we doing every day to change the national and hence global discourse in this country and in this world where we are having honest conversations about educational equity because it should be a human right. It should not be something we're fighting for. It should be how we begin conversations about education, learning and teaching. And if we're not doing this work with families and with communities, then we're really not doing this work. And I think that's really important to stress. We need to take a proactive stance. We can't remain reactive. On the one hand, we have COVID-19. On the other hand, we have ongoing systemic racism. It's not that these, that these things have just dropped out of the air. We have ongoing systemic racism that has always painted a certain national landscape for peoples of color in this country. And yet, when we think about what the purposes of education were meant to do for people, we have not begun to fulfill that, especially for the kids and the families who need us the most. And so, yes, we have to ask questions about access and opportunity. We also have to ask questions about the people who are in the classrooms teaching our kids. We have to ask questions about the leaders who are governing our schools and our universities and our colleges and schools of education. And we have to ask ourselves, do we have the same core commitment to ensuring that the lives of our kids and families and communities are central to everything that we do every single day? And if it is not, we need to have a different kind of conversation. And for me, any conversation about equity starts there. It doesn't start with the basic 101 types of conversations that some folks have about what it is. And then, okay, we got a basic understanding. Now let's just go back and do what we've always done. It starts with how do we radically reimagine teaching, learning, and engagement in ways where we are talking with and partnering with kids and families, communities, and schools? because we all have to be a part 
of the conversation in order to change the narrative about access and opportunity. Thank you. That is helpful in setting the stage for our next question, which I'm going to turn to Dr. Thompson to answer first. Um, as Samantha indicated earlier, our Education Policy Committee is looking at this issue of creating the type of learning environment that Dr. Kinlock or Dean Kinlock uh, described. And um, what are some of the policy changes that need to occur in order to enable these types of learning environments to succeed on the ground? Um, Dr. Thompson, do you want to talk a little bit about that? Sure, I'd be happy to. I think one of the things that's in play, uh, one of those uh, change uh, agents or levers, I should say, that is in place um, is a basic education funding formula that the state does have. Um, in theory, sounds good. In practice, we're not there. And we're not there because um, I don't think that there has been a clear enough definition of what equity is and the importance of equity and the facilitation of equity through uh, making sure that the right funding is provided for those districts, for those communities that need it the most. So I think that's, that's one thing, making sure that it's not simply um, a matter of having a structure without substance, but making sure that that funding formula that is indeed in place has the requisite funds and the focus on equity to make sure that it can provide the leverage that's needed to address many of the things that we've been talking about thus far. Uh, I think the other thing, and Dean Kenlock had alluded to this, I think teacher preparation programs are, are, are key at this point. Um, they can make the most of deeper learning and understand the importance of things like digital fluency. Um, they can help us understand if done right, they can bring into focus the notion of social emotional learning and culturally responsive learning within the context of education. I, I thought that uh, what, what Dean Kenlock had stated and Representative Ganey in making the distinction between education and learning is crucial. And I think teacher education, teacher preparation programs have to also spend the time to make that, that same distinction and to prepare teachers to understand the important role that they play in living out that distinction day to day in the classroom. Um, I think the other thing that has to, uh, has to happen is there, there has to be the elimination of, of barriers that prevent full participation of all peoples um, beyond, beyond what we see. And I'm, I'm, I'm talking right now about the, uh, the assessment programs that, uh, that the state has used, that, that districts have, have used. Um, we need to move beyond simply uh, fixating on numbers. And it's really got to be numbers and narratives together to validate student experiences. If we're going to see something that is going to help us learn from this crisis that we're currently in. And if we're really going to be um, a, um, I guess, a, a country, a, a state, uh, a region that is um, hoping to do right by our communities, those are the things that I think have to be in place. Thank you. And we are running very short on time and I wanna leave some time for questions, but I also want to get to our last question. So I know Dean Kinlock and Representative Gini, you probably wanna to respond to that question about policy, but I also would ask if you could talk a little bit about the ways in which uh, the students here at the university and the broader community could get involved in this issue. I would greatly appreciate it. 
I'll turn it over to you first, Representative Ganey. Right, Dean, thank you. Um, I think Dr. Thompson hit, hit, hit it on the nail. I'm going to bring it from a different level, though, but I think he was 100% accurate. When you talk about the funding formula, you're really talking about interest. And when we begin to talk about interest when it comes to any type of investment of money, you're talking about, you know, in the legislature, who has the votes, where the votes are coming from, and, you know, whether they deem that to be their interest. We have seen through decades that um, in, in, in communities that really need the extra funding, that has not been the interest. The interest has been coming from communities that are already well established and have a, ta and have a higher tax base. That's, that's been the interest. The interest has not been how do we create an equitable playing field. That's why the funding formula has always been a problem. You can do the funding formula, make everybody win. There's been models of that all around. The reality is the will is not there. You have to have the will to do that. And then secondly, if you really want to create an equitable, uh, an equitable school system, you have to hire black and brown teachers. You, you cannot continue to have a school that got one African-American teacher, but the, the student body is 60% African-American, and you think that someone that's never grew up around, like, you know, I ask people to, you know, have you grown up around black and brown people? Have you had that in your life? Because that's critical at a time right now. If you've come from a community where you, I don't care if you get a 4.0 through your college, your college career or whatever, and you're ready to teach, if you have not grown around, if you have not grown up in a diverse environment, when you're put in that environment, it's going to be difficult for you to understand some things because you don't come up in diversity. You come up in a community that looks exactly like you when you've never had an opportunity to learn other Americans because history didn't teach you. And so now we got you in front of a classroom and you're having problems because you don't understand the social economics of the environment in which you're teaching in is a problem. And if you want to diversify, if you, if you want to solve some of that, you have to diversify your teaching pool. And you have to be, in, the intent has to be there because there's so much that black and brown teachers bring to the table that don't exist right now just because of the wisdom. There's a difference between being smart and being wise. You can have 50 degrees and be smart and have no wisdom. But when you have wisdom because you lived in that lifestyle, when you go to teach, you can reach people because not how smart you are, but because you understand some of the environmental issues in which they come out of. And then thirdly, you got to take this time, us being in a pandemic is to being excited. Like, like, you know, when I was talking to the PPS teachers, I said, listen, you got a chance to do some things that makes you a student again so that you become a better teacher. Like, go back and understand why the Black Lives Matter, why they're out here, why they're protesting, why police violence is important. What you want to talk about, the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, the 2000, 2010, 2020? Go back and explain why this fight for some type of police community engagement that brings trust, respect, and honor is so important. Go back and understand the LGBTQ movement and be able to teach about it. Go back and talk about the different historical context that led us up to today. Because the more you know, the more you help a child grow. So don't look at this as just a problem. Look at it as an opportunity to be able to learn so that you can install and deposit in these kids the type of education, the type of learning that they need. And then fourthly, I'll leave it like that. If you really want to get involved, I tell people, if you really, really want to get involved, and I hear this all the time on all these calls. I'm, I really want to get involved. I really want to get involved. Well, you got to take, it's not about what I can tell you to do because I'm not in your heart. It's what in your heart you want to do. See, no one has to tell nobody else what to do when people really want to do it. They just do it. And so it's got to be in your heart to want to get involved at some level. It's got to be there. It's got to be that you understand that there have been some wrongs that have been done and that you're committed, not supportive, in erasing the wrongs. See, that comes from the heart because the heart will lead you to your passion. Your passion will lead you to development. Development will lead you to growth. So it's in you what you want to learn so that you can help somebody that needs your help do better. When we get to that level, we're starting to, we will begin to find equity. But as long as it's just a status quo, sexy conversation with no concrete action, then it's just the same conversation we had in the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, 
to 2000, 2010. Let's have a conversation of feel good with no action so that they can think that we understand. I'm beyond that. You want understanding? Get in the game. And let me just say, getting in the game is about equity, but it's also about justice. And so we can't leave the justice piece out because I think so many times we often, we, we conflate equity and justice. Equity is this intentional effort to do exactly what Dr. Thompson and Representative Ganey have talked about here. When we think about justice, we are also then moving toward a more tangible outcome for people to do freedom dreaming and freedom living. And it is about education, but it's also about living. And so how do we begin to think about equity and education as connected to justice in every aspect of our lives, from education and learning to schools and communities to the jobs that we are able to get or not get for various reasons. Now, I will also say that funding is really important. And I would go as far as to say funding and having a different funding formula, these things are important. And yet, because I know what it means to not have funding, because I know what it means to not have financial resources and to still think about the work that we need to do in the world with other people. I will say funding is important, but having the will and the investment to actually do differently is just as important even when the funding might not be present. And I wanna be really clear about that. I think oftentimes folks think that we can't do revolutionary work if we don't have a different formula for funding. And in part, that's exactly true. And in other part, it is also true that we have to continue to disrupt these systemic inequities and inequalities that are so pervasive in every facet of our human life. And how do we do that? We've been doing that with the faulty funding formula and we shouldn't have to, but we also have been doing that without having access to the resources that would make doing that work easier and quicker. And yet we've always been doing it. I'm not saying that we should continue to do it in the absence of resources. I'm saying that we need to do it with resources, with a better funding formula. But at the same time, the folks who are on the grounds disrupting and transforming, they're doing the work even if they don't have the resources that would make the work easier. And so I wanna give honor and credit to those folks who have been making a way out of no way. And they have been moving mountains and they have been going in schools and in communities to understand conversations and partnerships that we must have with other people in order to engage in transformative revolutionary work that involves teaching and learning. I think that's the work that we are all committed to doing. I also wanna say, you know, we talk about teachers and we talk about we need to have more teachers of color, black and brown teachers, and we do. Completely agree. We also need to have more black and brown educational leaders and school administrators who would actually be able to hire and support and retain a more racially and ethnically and linguistically diverse teacher workforce, but who also would be able to make decisions about resources being reallocated to the places and spaces that those resources need to be reallocated to. So we need both. We need both teachers of color, administrators and educational leaders of color. And then we need partners who are able to help push this work. And then I just wanna say a quick note about teacher education because it's come up a few times here. And I just wanna put this there. I wanna put this out there. Teacher education programs in this country, for the most part, need a complete overhaul. And I am talking about a complete overhaul, including our teacher education program at the University of Pittsburgh. We are not exempt from this work. And I will say it because I've said it to my colleagues. We will never be exempt from this work. We have to take a proactive stance when it comes to understanding and enacting pedagogical practices that are about educational equity, justice, and transformative teaching and learning. We cannot continue to just pull back a piece of the pie and say, now let's put this little piece in it because it's missing when the rest of the pie is not digestible. So we've got to figure out ways to think differently about teaching and teacher education. We have got to figure out ways to think differently about who we think should be teachers in comparison to who we think should not be teachers historically. 
you know, I will say I've had in my K-12 experiences more black teachers than I ever knew what to do. I had black teachers who lived in my community in Charleston, South Carolina, who knew where I would be if I were not in school when they would come to my house. Like that's the commitment. And I don't know if we can teach that kind of commitment as much as modeling it for other people. And that's the commitment that we have to have in teacher education programs. It is not just an expert who is standing before students imparting knowledge. It is about having someone who is committed to the work, being able to go into schools and communities to talk deeply about learning, the joy of teaching, and the ways that we understand people who are in communities who might not be seen as educators as educators. And I think that's the beginning of transforming teaching and teacher education programs in this country, being able to see everyone as part of this equation, as part of the reason why we do what we do. Thank you. Well, we're almost out of time. We have time for one question. And I think you actually answered the other two questions that are out there. So um, the question that we have uh, that we haven't really addressed is, are there districts or schools in the region that seem to be addressing education equity well? Um, so for me, I'm not, to be quite honest, I'm not sure. Um, I haven't studied that to be able to speak on it. Um, you know, you know, and I'm not going to speculate. I'm not sure. That's something that I have to look up. I have to, uh, do some homework on. So I don't, I don't have that answer at this time. Okay. And Dr. I've, I've, I've looked into it. I've studied it. I've been following the districts across the state. Um, Representative Ganey said he's not going to speak on it at this time, and so I'm not going to speak on it either at this time. Um, with the direct answer, as much as I would say, I know that there are phenomenal educators across the region who are engaging in this work with students. Now, has it risen to a systems level in terms of entire districts? Um, that's something that I am still wondering and I'm still looking into, but I can point out amazing teachers and school leaders who have that commitment and who understand the importance of it. It takes more than just a couple of folks in order to impact a system on a larger level, but it starts with a couple of folks. Thank you. What I would add to that is I think it's very easy to find those one-offs, those schools that may be doing um, good work in this in this area, um, essentially because of what Dean Kenlock just alluded to, the fact that you have good teachers, you have exemplary, um, you know, leaders who are um, are committed to this work and 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 committed to their their communities and their families, and and they're getting some excellent results. But when it comes to exemplars in terms of districts and states, I don't know of any. Okay, sounds like there's more work to be done. So I'm gonna turn this back over to Meredith to close us out, but I wanna say thank you so much to our panelists and our attendees. I really appreciate you participating. Yeah, I, I don't think I've nodded my head so much during a panel discussion. So thank you so much to all the panelists for providing such great insights into what equity means, how to humanize education opportunities and provide access for every student um, and ways to address some of the existing challenges to achieving equity and justice. Um, and thanks to our audience members for some insightful questions and for joining us. So clearly there's a lot of work to be done. That's what we've learned here. And um, we encourage you to get in the game as uh, to use Representative Ganey's words. Um, but we realize it can be hard to know where to start. So in addition to the panelists' suggestions, we've come up with a few suggestions of our own, like attend your school board meetings to see how the school plans uh, to implement equity policies in this new environment, in the COVID environment. Uh, contact your elected officials to tell them that this is an important issue to you. Uh, students can join the LC Forum program or join a student organization that deals with education. Um, 
Of course, everyone should vote in the 2020 general election. Um, for those of you who registered for this session, we've prepared a resource guide that details how you can get involved in education equity at Pitt, in politics, in the community, online, and at work. Um, with various organizations, direct service providers um, with our linked as well, with volunteer opportunities for everyone. Um, for those of you who are joining us via live stream, you can access this resource guide at the LC Forum's website at lchillmanforum.pit.edu under the publication tab. Um, but if you should have any questions or would like to contact the IOP, you can definitely email me at mlm72. Once again, thank you to our panelists. Thanks, Brianna, our, our, our moderator, and uh, to our audience. And a big thank you to Pitt Serves and the Pitt's Office of Community and Governmental Relations for hosting Civic Action Week and allowing us to be a part of it. Thank you for spending uh, your time with us.